Welcome everyone to the Tippy webinar series. Uh, thank you for joining us for our first presentation in our workplace well-being webinar series. My name is Ashley Durham and I am the Director of Alumni Engagement at the Tippy College of Business and I'll be your moderator today. May is Mental Health Awareness Month and based on the U.S. Surgeon General's Framework for Workplace Mental Health and Well-Being, we have created a five-part workplace well-being series where we will provide evidence-based tools for helping you be successful at work and help to promote employee well-being within your own capacity. This series is all in thanks to the research done by our very own Tippy faculty. I would like to thank Stephen Courtright and all the faculty from our Management and Entrepreneurship Department for their work on this series. It is always a pleasure to partner together to bring the knowledge of our faculty to our alumni and friends across the globe. Today, I'm excited to have Ian Crawford and Emily Campion share their presentation entitled Protection from Harm, Pri Prioritizing Psychological Safety and Enabling Adequate Rest. Just some information before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A, not the chat, in your Zoom control panel. You'll see that there is a Q&A box. We are actively monitoring that during this presentation to try and address all of your questions. As a reminder, all of our virtual presentations are uploaded to the college's YouTube page with closed captions a few days following our live webinar event. Finally, you are encouraged to stay to the end of the webinar so that we can gather your thoughts on today's presentation. Your feedback helps make our virtual programming even better, so we appreciate you taking time to answer our four question survey at the end of the presentation. Now let's introduce our presenters. Ian Crawford is an Associate Professor of Management and Entrepreneurship and a Henry B. Tippy Research Fellow in the Tippy College of Business. He conducts research on employee engagement team effectiveness, stress, and burnout. He has consulted with numerous organizations about their employee engagement and team effectiveness. Emily Campion is an assistant professor of management and entrepreneurship, and her research focuses on how to use machine learning to improve organizational systems and also how people manage their fatigue, especially in the world of Zoom meetings. Emily applies her research to help organizational decision makers enhance worker experience. Thank you both for being here today and for kicking off our Workplace Wellbeing webinar series. Thank you, Ashley. We appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. I'd also like to welcome my extremely smart and talented colleague, Emily, to what has colloquially become known as Tippy's Men in Blazers yes. studio. Good job wearing Thank your blazer. You. Um, also, it's your turn to stand on the box today. Yes. I have the height advantage. A little bit. Yeah. A little bit. Uh, <laughs> it's, you know, Daniel Newton, when he's in here, he's four inches taller than me and I'm on the box. If you're getting none of these jokes, you have to go back to a few of our previous webinars. Just look this up and you'll understand better. <laughs> Um, as we get started today, uh, we will be monitoring the Q&A live during the presentation. We have it up. If you see us glancing over here or down here, we've got two screens. And um, Emily may interact with some of the questions during the presentation if she can quickly type a response. Otherwise, we're planning on saving plenty of time at the end to uh, take any of your questions live as well. So use that Q&A box. Um, to begin... I would like to show you some figures to hopefully give you helpful but uh, potentially depressing context about why we have created this mental health and well-being webinar series this month. Um, first, it is not news that employers are desperate to hire. Um, monthly unfilled job openings have more than doubled in the last decade. Currently, there are more than 10 million available jobs going unfilled every single month. And every employer we talk to, we hear this is their number one concern. We can't find people to hire. As I talk to my students, I tell them there has never been a better time to get a job. But people are retreating from the workforce. Um, the labor force participation rate has been declining um, for decades and uh, still hasn't recovered from where it plummeted to uh, at the start of the pandemic. In fact, the current labor force participation rate, if I extended this chart out 50 years, is at the lowest that it's been even going back all the way to 1970. 
um, also new is of people who are working, more and more are choosing to work part-time voluntarily. Um, in January, Wall Street Journal reported that 22 million people are choosing to work part-time for non-economic reasons, meaning they could work full-time, but they're choosing not to. And that number is six times higher than the 4 million people who are working part-time and wish that they could be working full-time. That ratio is the highest that it's been in two decades. So where are all the people at? Well, they are currently not very happy with work or life uh, for that matter. Uh, this uh, couple of statistics coming from Gallup's uh, most recent State of the Workforce report issued summer of 2022. Um, they report that uh, work engagement has stalled out at one in five employees. The daily stress that employees report feeling on their job has risen to an all-time high since data has been collected, even higher than the previous all-time record that was set in 2020 during the onslaught of the pandemic. And then sadly, the share of people rating themselves as very happy has dropped to 12%. That's one in eight, which is also the lowest level ever recorded going back to when data began to be collected on this question in 1972. Are you depressed yet? Yeah. Well, I'm not, I'm, I'm not done. Um, one more. So Gallup reported in March of 2022, people's responses to whether they felt strongly that their organization cares about their well-being. And what's fascinating to see is there was this natural spike in 2020 as um, employers uh, quickly created a plan in response to the onset of the pandemic. They improved their communication. And many employees believe that this represented new and genuine concern for them, their work and their lives. Mm -hmm. And then since it has plummeted back to previously low levels. And if this is the new normal that we've reached, uh, this is a very unfortunate backslide because at least according to Gallup, um, employees who feel strongly that their organization does care about their well-being, they are three times more likely to be engaged at work. They are 71% less likely to be burned out and 69% less likely to be searching for a new job. Um, so should we be alarmed about this? Well, again, in 2022, Gallup estimated that the annual loss to the global economy because of low engagement is $7.8 trillion. And to just try to put in perspective how much that is, I love the stack of $100 bills analogy. So if you went to the Federal Reserve and withdrew $7.8 trillion in fresh $100 bills, which ought not to be difficult, um, and you stack that up in a vertical stack from sea level, it would reach merely 500 miles high, which <laughs> goes into space. The International Space Station is orbiting at 250 miles above the surface of the Earth, and even the Hubble Space Telescope is orbiting at 320 miles. So this would go double of the orbital height of the International Space Station. Um, one last quote from Gallup, and then we'll continue on. So their CEO, Jim Clifton, acknowledges that movements to improve work-life balance, implement four-day work weeks, and expand remote work are everywhere now. But it's just not the hours or the imbalance or location that leave workers unhappy. It's what's happening at work that makes people miserable. I literally, 30 minutes before this webinar, had a student sitting in the chair in my office right there talking about how my job feels miserable, but I don't speak up because I don't want to get fired. And um, in their largest study of burnout, Gallup points to these five factors that are influencing this misery. It's unfair treatment at work, unmanageable workload, unclear communication from managers, a lack of manager support, and unreasonable time pressure to complete overwhelming workloads. So if after hearing all this, you feel like I am running around with my hair on fire, that would be true if I had any hair left to be on fire. Um, and it's not that I've lost my hair. I just tell people it's migrated south. 
to my eyebrows, ears, and nose. Uh, but I'm not kidding. As we were preparing these opening slides, Emily came up to my office and walked in and said, Ian, are you okay? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, this is a signal. <laughs> there is a signal that things need to change. So this comes from the introduction of the groundbreaking U.S. Surgeon General um, report on workplace mental health and well-being issued in October of 2022. And it recognizes that many workers no longer feel comfortable sacrificing their health or their family or their communities for work. That is just no longer an acceptable trade-off. And the biggest point that we want to make today to kick off these series of webinars is that even though organizations are increasingly aware that if worker mental health suffers, not only are they suffering, but their company will also suffer in terms of productivity and creativity and retention, mm -hmm. but supporting mental health and well being is about more than just providing access to counseling services or more days off. Rather, the very nature of what we do at work, of how we work, that has to change. It has to become more of an engine of when, uh, mental health and well being. So, with that major point, I'm now going to turn it over to Emily. Wonderful. Thank you. To lead us from there. Thank you. <clears throat> So whether the workplace becomes an engine to foster well-being really depends on people's willingness to get in the car. I have to give credit to Ian for thinking of that line. Yeah, there you go. Uh, this increasingly requires organization, organizations to consider all five parts of this framework. Now, we're going to walk you through these five parts over the next five weeks. Ian and I are going to cover protection from harm, but you also must care about connection and community and work-life harmony, which I appreciate that it's... We're moving away from the word balance. I feel like it's overblown. Harmony sounds a lot nicer. Whether or not you matter at work and then also opportunity for growth. Um, now, a lot of what we'll be presenting feels like common sense, but unfortunately there's this disconnect because it's not all common practice. We're hoping to help you bridge this and normalize some of these ideas. So the protection from harm uh, notion really focuses on, we're focusing on three themes though. There's a number of themes if you'd like to read that report. Um, the first is promoting financial and job security. The second is prioritizing psychological safety. Um, the third is enabling adequate rest. So I will start with financial and job security. If it moves on. Oh, I clicked away clicked from the slides, the okay. Zoom faux pas. Okay, so researchers have consistently found a, a relationship between money and happiness. We think it's gonna be, you see this green, green uh, highlighted section here. I cannot take credit for this visual. This is from the New York Times. Um, but we assume it's going to be linear and that the more money we have, the happier we will be. And generally, that is the case. Um, but it's got nuance as everything does and all depends, right? So, so instead, what we find is if we zoom out of our uh, and take a look at our life, we do find that the more money we make, the more positive of an evaluation we have of our overall life. But it, let's zoom back in that day to day. We actually find that there's this threshold uh, when it comes to thinking about our daily well-being. So this research is from Kahneman and Deaton in, in 2010. Feels a little dated, but hangs true still of, of nearly a million or half a million U.S. households. And they find that rising income is associated with decreases in daily stress and worry up to $75,000 at that time. That was $2,009. Today, we're talking about $105,000. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it doesn't mean that all of your problems go away with higher income, but less money is associated with far greater worry, sadness, and stress, and the inability to, to make ends meet. But let's take this a step further because Ruberton et al. I think do, do a really nice job of adding a little bit more nuance. Don't we love that? And they say, really, it's about cash on hand when we think about well-being. So here's a direct quote from them. They say, immediately accessible accounts such as savings and checking accounts are accessed far more frequently, offering a persistent reminder of financial health. And I like this term, financial health, versus just thinking of wealth broadly. So the two of these really key things to take away here 
are that financial well-being is about more than just your overall wealth or income. The real question is your perception of health. In a study by Bankrate uh, in uh, uh, January of 2022, they found that 56% of Americans can't cover a $1,000 emergency expense. So from this study, we might be able to conclude or at least suggest that Americans, at least half, uh, don't feel financially healthy. And this isn't just about income. This is tied to our next concept, which is about um, uh, job security. So I know that Southwest right now hasn't had the greatest maybe a couple months in terms of news, <laughs> maybe, but I still think uh, their perspective on how to treat their employees remains. I don't I haven't seen a lot in terms of maybe them um, being trashed for that, but certainly some other things they're having trouble with. Nevertheless, I'm a big fan of Herb Kelleher and his perspective on how to um, improve employee experiences at work. And he says, and I think this holds true in the late 90s, although it, I was about eight at that time. So I was considering other things, but <laughs> it still matters now. Our most important tools for building employee partnership are around job security and a stimulating work environment. So because we need money to live, job security is hugely important to the well-being of workers and therefore should be a key consideration for managers and other organizational decision makers. But financial and job security aren't the only part of the equation. Another thing managers and employees need to think about is safety. And we think about that as both psychological and physical. And I'll just interject a thought that um, I don't think what we're trying to say is just pay people more money. Mm -hmm. Because uh, like this uh, Nobel Prize winning economist research shows, having more money doesn't solve all of your problems. Mm -hmm. But it's the perspective of do people feel that they are secure with the money they have. Mm -hmm. And as a manager, I would want to know if I have employees that are afraid of the car breaking down. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not implying that as a manager, I would go up and ask my employees, Emily, do you have $1,000 in your account to save your, uh, to cover an emergency? Right. Uh, that might feel invasive. Mm -hmm. But I do think I would want to know um, whether my employees feel that they have financial health. Yeah. And then provide some access to, uh, and, and this is becoming more common for organizations. Um, I'm familiar with several who are providing access to just simple, basic, and free financial counseling, mm -hmm. because income is only one half of this equation. There's also the way people choose to spend their money, and that's their choice, not that their employer has um, uh, direction over that. Okay, so let's talk about the perceptions of psychological safety and how it might be prioritized. Um, Every year, I have an opportunity to be in a room with about 30 to 40 executives, and I get to spend the day with them talking about building and leading effective teams. And literally the first two hours of the discussion are in response to two simple questions. And I want you to pretend that you are among these executives, and I am asking you to do the following two things. I want you to close your eyes and visualize the very best team experience you have ever had in your life. And it could be a work team or it could be a volunteer club or an organization or a sports team, anything. And I tell them, see those people in your mind, remember their names, um, remember what you were doing and specifically recall what made that team so great. And after they capture that in their mind, I say, now I want you to go to a darker time in your life and remember the very worst team that you ever worked with. And again, it could be of any kind of team, mm -hmm. or see their faces, remember their names and all the feelings you had about that and capture in your mind what made it so bad. And then I say, tell me about it. And for the next two hours, I'm writing on the board. And I wanna show you, I took pictures from my most recent, this is exactly the discussion of these executives. And first, what you're seeing is their responses about their very most effective teams. And just take a look at what you see on this whiteboard. Uh, note that the asterisks are next to any concept or comment that was mentioned multiple times. And see if you identify any patterns and anything that resonates with your memories and experiences of that most effective team. And now I'll show you the board for their very worst team. And you can see again, a few issues that were mentioned multiple times. 
and see if you identify any patterns here and how they resonate with your own experience. And everybody's had it, best team, worst team. And some of the most interesting part of this discussion is that uh, I've had executives who said the same team was both mm -hmm. that went from being the best to the worst or others that had said, yeah, I was on one that was the worst and it became the best. Um, and everyone wants to know what makes the difference. Well, it's a lot of things, but there are some things more than others. And Google wanted to answer the same question and they commissioned a study several years ago. They nicknamed it Project Aristotle. And if any company could identify in all the data that they gather, what makes the difference between teams that are effective versus those that are less so, Google should be able to do it. Mm -hmm. And they reported that they were looking at over you know, 180 teams from the company, following them for years, collected all kinds of data on their personality types, whether they socialized inside or outside of work, if they had similar personalities or skills. Mm -hmm. And like literally nothing that they could find made any difference. The who part didn't seem to matter, but how they interacted sure did. Mm -hmm. And what they found was the difference between their soaring versus stumbling teams was whether they were able to build a climate of psychological safety. Mm -hmm. um, this is not a new concept. This has been studied at least for 30 years, going all the way back to Bill Kahn's original research in the 1990s. Um, Amy Edmondson is probably known as the uh, world leading figure in research on psychological safety. And she defined it as simply a shared belief that this workplace is safe for interpersonal risk taking. Mm -hmm. It's like this confidence that you can speak up and others will not embarrass, reject, or punish you. And it comes from having this trust and mutual respect so that people are comfortable being themselves. Now, why does psychological safety make such a big difference between effective and ineffective teams? There's also a whole literature that helps us understand how psychological safety is linked with better engagement, more a uh, better job performance, more helping at work. And it has to do with what happens to your brain when you feel safe versus when you feel on high alert. Um, there's been rigorous experimental evidence accumulating through psychology and applied psychology that shows when your brain is in a negative mood state of fear and anxiety, it generally narrows your focus to figure out how to simply eliminate the threats that you face. Rather, when you are in a more relaxed and safe state, even in a mildly positive mood, your, your mind relaxes, your mental flexibility is greater, your memory recall is higher, you see more possibilities, you have more confidence to act, you share more information, you debate more alternatives, and ultimately you find better and more innovative alternatives to any type of problems that you're mm -hmm. facing. So how do you promote it? Where does it come from? So our friends, Lance Frazier and Ryan Klinger, Ryan was my classmate at the University of Florida in 2011. Mm -hmm. He was your former coworker before you came to yeah. Iowa with us. Um, they aggregated every study they could find that had ever been done about psychological safety to figure out what are the top promoters. And these were the top three that they found. Number one by far, strongest promoter of psychological safety is having a group of supportive peers that are understanding, who are helpful, and that alone, strongest predictor. Second is having well-designed work where you have clearly defined roles in which you have some autonomy to act as you are also interacting with others. And then the third is having positive relationships with your leaders. Mm -hmm. Interesting that peers was number one and leaders was number three. I also thought that was fascinating, but in particular it is uh, very helpful when you have leaders that you like, admire, trust, and respect. Hugely important to promote your work group psychological safety. Um, so how might you promote more of these things? So the first thing I would say is try to measure it. It's hard to know where your psychological safety is at without assessing it. Um, this actually is Amy Edmondson's original 1999 measure of psychological safety, still used today. Seven simple questions that uh, people rate their agreement with and that helps establish a baseline of psychological safety in the organization. Um, I had an executive one time who uh, told me that he had found this seven item survey and had given it to all of his team members anonymously. 
um, meaning they responded anonymously. And then he charted their responses on Excel. And then they had a whole meeting where he just put up the chart and said, let's talk about it. Um, we're going to have a small experience with that right now as a group of executives, wherever you are. So uh, Ashley has preloaded some of these questions. We're not going to do all seven because we don't have time, but let's at least try a couple. So Ashley, will you pull up a Zoom poll of number two? And we're going to have everyone on the webinar right now answer poll question number two in reference to your current work group. And I will tell you, this is all anonymous. We're not reporting any of this to your supervisor. Uh, your secrets are safe with us, so you can answer completely honestly. None of this will get back to anyone. Um, so rate your responses in relation to your current work group, which is whatever group of people that's most salient in your working life right now. Members of your team can bring up problems and tough issues. I'll give you a minute to get your response in. Tell us whether you agree or disagree. I'm inclined to ask your response for our department. Oh. I think we get a lot of fives. Yeah. Yeah. We, I'm going to respond myself. <laughs> Am I allowed to? Oh, yes, no. I think. I'm a panelist. Okay. So responses are up. I believe you can see this on the screen, but if not, yes. let me describe. Um, strong majorities at least agree to some extent, 45% uh, agreement, 33% strong agreement. So that is good news. Let's celebrate yeah. that. Yeah. I'm always a fan of when things are going well to reflect on and celebrate and recognize that that doesn't happen by magic, that happens by effort. So that's fantastic. Um, a fewer proportion, about one in five, have some version of disagreement. And for the 4% of you that strongly disagree, I feel for you right now, mm -hmm. but there can be hope. Uh, let's try maybe one or two more. How about poll number four? It's safe to take a risk on this team. Respond to number four. Ashley, can we pull up number yes. four? I'm doing it. I'm sorry, I'm having a moment of technical difficulty. One totally two, understand. Here. Got it. All right, here we go. Poll number four. Thank you, Ashley. All right. Think about that team. Would it be safe to take a risk? Or would you be embarrassed, rejected, or punished for trying something that maybe doesn't work? As soon as you were talking about how you develop psychological safety, someone asked this question. What uh, what suggestions do you have for approaching creating psychological safety? Oh, PJ? yes. That's perfectly fine. You have anticipated my next <laughs> slide. Okay, what do we got? Okay, similar response rates, uh, about the same proportion, uh, a little higher, maybe a quarter, uh, disagree to some extent. And then I can do math in my head, 45, 65%, at least agree to some extent with 20% strongly agreeing. Um, these are all intended to measure the same basic perception, psychological safety. And I think if we asked all seven questions, we would probably see similar distributions. Um, note that some of these are positively worded, some are negatively worded. For example, number one is an indicator of psychological peril or not safety. Um, so I would encourage you to try this with your work group. Have people anonymously respond to these, aggregate the responses and discuss them in a team meeting. And if you're sitting there thinking right now, there is no way that my work group would even respond to this at all. Mm -hmm. That's probably your gauge of psychological safety right there. Yeah. And there's some work to be done. Mm -hmm. So let's go to that next slide and talk just a little bit about um, how do you encourage psychological safety? So um, this comes from experimental research that Anita Woolley and colleagues did. They've experimentally analyzed more than 700 teams and discovered some key differences between those that were quickly able to create psychological safety. Remember, these were teams of strangers that they put together. Um, and they found that three things. Uh, number one, teams that could establish more psychological safety practice what they call conversational turn-taking, where people are monitoring the extent to which everyone is equally contributing to the conversation. And if you notice that there is one or two people that are constantly dominating the conversation while others sit in silence, that is a signal that there is uh, absence of psychological safety that needs to be improved. And one way I've seen skillful individuals do this is just simply say and acknowledge to those who speak more frequently, thank you for those valuable contributions. Mm -hmm. Let's maybe take a minute to listen and hear what so-and-so and other so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so have to say. We haven't heard their perspective yet and it's essential. So let's all listen to what they have to say. 
A second important practice is to demonstrate social sensitivity. And the people that can do this are able to read really complex emotions in people's faces without those people ever saying a word. And one way you can know your ability to do this is to take the um, popular reading the mind in the eyes test. If you've never heard of it, it's a simple test where you're given um, 32 uh, scenarios of people's, uh, you only get this portion of their eyes. Um, and you have to guess which emotion are they experiencing. So take a second, look here, make your guess. Emily, what's your guess? My guess is panic. That, that would be panicked. right. Good <laughs> job. You've got emotional sensitivity. That's perfect. So yes, feel good about that. Thank you. Um, so I would encourage all of you to go to socialintelligence.labinthewild.org and take this free reading the mind and the eyes test and just find out how good are you at reading people's emotions, looking only at their eyes. It's hugely valuable to have people in groups who just can give the knowing glance where you can look over, acknowledge someone, what they're feeling and thinking in the moment without ever saying a word. It does loads to build psychological safety in the moment when things especially are intense. Mm -hmm. Third thing, and probably the hardest thing, is to be willing to let down your guard. A lot of people feel like they need to put up fronts at work, that they can't show who they really are. Mm -hmm. And there are reasons for that for sure. But being willing to let your guard down means increasing your willingness to be vulnerable and becoming more comfortable with sometimes emotional conversations. Um, and this can be scary to do. And I will say that it really does help when those who are higher status in a work group are willing to take the lead mm -hmm. and show that this is okay. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing to think of as a way to increase your willingness to have perhaps more emotional or more vulnerable conversations is not just ask, how's it going? And then move on to the next um, item of business, but ask people like, how are you really doing? And then be quiet and listen. And when people ask you that question, be willing to offer more than just things are fine. Mm -hmm. uh, because we know from the movie Italian Jobs what fine stands for. It means freaked out, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. We are all walking around feeling fine. We just need some more willingness to talk about it. How valuable is this? I mean, I got to say, uh, it was remarkable this past March watching the Iowa women's basketball team storm through the Big Ten championships in the NCAA tournament. Um, not only are they incredibly skilled, but where they particularly where they particularly excel is psychological safety. I remember one moment watching the tournament games when uh, Gabby Marshall had missed several three pointers in a row, and they cut to a, a clip of. Caitlin Clark putting her arm around her and mm -hmm. speaking encouragingly. And Rebecca Lobo, the commentator, was saying, Caitlin's sitting there telling her, keep shooting, you're open, keep taking the risk. And it was just magical mm -hmm. to watch that run through the NCAA tournament. Mm -hmm. So I'm now going to give it back to the Caitlin Clark of our department. Oh, you're going to say that and I'm going to blush. And she's going to talk My to God. us about All right. enabling adequate rest. Thank you, Ian. Yes, enabling adequate rest. So what we've talked about so far, I think, has really hinged on what other people are doing in the organization. Uh, and so your experience really depends on them. What we're going to talk about now is how you can maybe take some control back for yourself and identify ways that you can recover. And so this is about enabling adequate rest. I want you to think for a moment, what are the things that you do to recover from work? So for some people, it's going home and sitting and watching TV and scrolling on your phone. I'll bet that's not a offering you this type of recovery you think it is. Um, or, or for some of you, it's volunteering for uh, one of our, one of my wonderful colleagues, our wonderful colleagues, Semin does pottery, you know, like we all get, I think you do tennis. I'm looking at your schedule right now. You've got tennis later. Okay. So we would do all these sorts of things to help us recover. Um, and I want you to really consider what you're doing and if you're doing it with intention. So we can group these into three sort of high, higher level groupings, the detaching, relaxing, and mastering types of activities. The first detaching is really aimed at fully separating ourselves from work, and that is engaging in maybe, you know, going for a run or some type of intense workout to recover from our work demands. 
The next is relaxing. And these are things that are low physical and mental effort. So I'd say watching TV maybe, or easy reading. And I do clarify easy reading because reading a journal article would not be easy reading. Um, and it's not relaxing. Um, but, and then we've got mastering, which is a really, really interesting category. So these are learning new things, learning to cook, taking up a new hobby, maybe volunteering. And these are help helping our brain engage maybe in some ways where we could still develop a skill, but it's just not necessarily related to work. And each of these groupings are really nice. Typologies are really valuable, but they're even more valuable when they actually uh, differentially predict things. And so these three we can see actually do give us different uh, energy experiences later. So what do I mean by that? So with detaching and relaxing, you're uh, reducing your fatigue, we would say, or you're less tired after, after you experience these most of the time. Whereas mastery, you're more energized. And what we would say in the research is you experience more vigor. Um, and so these are really important ways for us to think about like, how are you using your time after work, whatever time that is for you? How are you using your weekends to recover and taking the time to really figure that out? Understanding yourself is a lifelong pursuit and it changes over time. So you continue to have to run these tests on yourself to figure out like what is actually helping me recover from work. All right, so I don't have TikTok because I'm just, I feel like I've aged out of it, but I have Reels, Instagram Reels, and we get everything like two weeks later. So <laughs> so a trend right now that I love because I'm in my mid thirties and loving it. I hear forties are even better. Um, so I'm actually, I don't know how old you are. I looked at you to say 43. 40 okay, 43 good, people. okay. <laughs> So this is my favorite trend right now in TikTok is how you spent your night, your like weekend nights at 25 versus how you spent your weekend nights in your thirties. And I love this because in your twenties, you're like having a cocktail. You can see him on the left. He's singing to himself in the mirror, spritzing, you know, some fragrance dancing and all of this sort of thing. We've all done that and we know it. Then in your thirties, I love this. The video is like self-affirmation and he's saying it to himself in the mirror. He's, he's got sage down on the counter. You can see he's like burning it, you know? So that's helping him recover in your thirties. The point of this jokes aside is that we really should be testing ourselves often to ensure that we're continuing to engage in activities that actually bring us rest instead of things we think we should be doing, um, like sitting and watching new shows. So this means doing some tests on yourself. This means journaling, if that makes sense to you. This means maybe talking to a, a friend or a partner, whoever, to talk about your experience, to figure out what is actually restful. So this is what I would recommend. Try a few nights of just the totally relaxing activities, you know, whatever that may mean for you, probably sitting and watching TV or Netflix or one of the hundred million streaming services we have now. Um, you can't keep track for a few evenings and jot down how you, how you feel after that activity, jot down how you feel the next day. Cause recovery really should be informing next day experiences. We recover from work, not only for that evening, but in order to get up and do it again. Um, and then try things that are related to, uh, detachment. So go ahead and go running after work or exercise in whatever way that makes sense to you. Um, and see how you feel the next day with that. And then finally, learn something new in the evenings. You'll likely find that a mix of these at different, at different times works best, um, but it's important you continue to consider how you're spending your time because this exercise should really help you understand you have control about how you spend your time outside of work. I know it doesn't always feel like it. You get home from work, you've got stuff. I know you've got kiddos, I've got cats. Okay, they require attention, but you've got things, right? You've got things and you feel like you don't always have control. Um, and so doing this sort of test for yourself can help you realize you do have a lot more control than you think you do. It can also uh, help you understand better what actually offers uh, recovery and rest. I know that for me, I think that sitting and watching Madam Secretary, which I know is an old show now, I don't care, it's still good. Scrolling through reels is relaxing. It's not, I'm, I'm constantly realizing that's a silly thing to do. So I try to change, change it as much as I can. Um, and then it should be able to also help you identify where maybe work is causing a disruption. So if you're sitting on your phone, um, uh, I just saw a really interesting question. Tony, I'm going to get back to you at the end because I love that question um, about uh, recommendation for prior to work. But but thinking about if you're on your phone and you're emailing. Now, we were emailing yesterday about the webinar. We shouldn't have done that. I had your voice in my head. We shouldn't have, but we did. And you did respond. Thank you. Um, but but we have to consider how our, how our jobs are maybe interrupting our work lives too, or our home lives too much. 
So as an employer, what can you do to enable this? And I, I think sometimes it feels like we can't do much, but there are small things we can do. For example, you can have rules on no emails after hours rules. Microsoft Outlook makes this very easy. If you try to send an email after five, it has a little alert at the top that says, you know, most people read their emails between eight and five. Do you want to schedule this for later? I never say yes to that. I just press send. It's just the because we know this doesn't mean we do it. Like yeah. we, It's all as much as a struggle for us <laughs> as everybody else. It is. Um, or no meeting days, right? So allowing one day a week where we are not going to meet with anyone on Thursday, that is precious time for us to do deep work. And you have, you really have to make that conscious decision, decision and reestablish, communicate and respect those boundaries over and over. NerdWallet did this as an example where they have four days, I think you were telling me four days per year where the company just shuts down. No one is allowed at work or to do work. That is for you to take, to do what you need. And that's reinforcement from the organization from higher up saying, we understand this is necessary. Four days a year doesn't sound like much, but you know, when most doctors places are only open during work hours, it's tough to make those appointments, right? And for those of you in the room who are maybe unsure of the role that you play in your, your employees' work recovery or even mental health, we're still trying to figure that out in this research. And fortunately, we have amazing people in our department, including a graduate student who's working on this very issue of mental health at work and what that means. So what he's finding so far is that individuals, employees are more and more comfortable to talk about some of the things you mentioned that they they are having trouble with at work, like work overload um, or abusive supervision or just uh, supervisors who aren't understanding. And they're more than happy to suggest ideas to improve it, you know, reasonable accommodation, obviously, but mental health days and, and maybe other PTO options. Um, a key challenge, and I want to say this really lightly because I think middle managers have it really tough and they don't give, they don't get the credit. <laughs> and I'll just add like yeah. middle managers, especially burnout is highest among middle managers. That's what Gallup has found yeah. in these statistics that it's risen for middle managers the most. So there's so much on their shoulders. Yeah. I try to make my students understand this when they tell me their struggles with their managers. I'm like, let's think about what they're dealing with. Right. So taking a moment, I don't know if they get it. I'm trying for you guys. I'm trying. <laughs> Um, but the ch challenge here is supervisors. So what Nate and his team are finding is that uh, supervisors are viewed as, the, as these key figures in, in helping resolve this issue, whatever that may mean for you. Um, but the problem is some of them feel it's definitely part of their job. The others don't. And that's really complicated. Yeah. And there are benefits to being among those who feel that promoting mental health is an integral part of their job. Mm -hmm. I actually have data that I've analyzed and not yet published it. But in an organization employing over 10,000 people, we asked employees how strongly they agreed that their supervisor strongly supports their health and well-being at work. Mm -hmm. And um, employee health risk factors, like we had them also report separately a host of things like high blood pressure, um, heart disease, uh, smoking, all kinds of different things. Health risk factors were 17% lower mm -hmm. among employees who felt their supervisor strongly promoted their health and well-being. Right. So it's really, you can see how much falls on the supervisor to be the, the engine, to bring that analogy back. But, uh, but the net out here also to help protect our supervisors is if we are going to make mental health care, uh, whether that's just being understanding and encouraging the use of resources or whatever that means for your organization, they also need training. They need to understand it's part of their role. And that might mean changing their job description. I can't help it. The HR person in me is like, no, let's put it in the job description so they understand. And then also train them well and provide them feedback and um, a support as they're supporting their employees. So... To help wrap things up, we want to give you a chance to think what have been the practical takeaways that have occurred to you as we've been talking in the short amount of time together. So reflect on this question, how can your workplace better support physical and mental health needs of workers? And reflect for just 30 seconds and write down what were the most important points that you gained from today. I'm going to give you 30 seconds, literally 30 seconds on the clock. You can go questions. Excited. Okay, whatever you wrote down, I promise that if that is the only thing you remember from today, 
today was a success. Let me conclude with just one practice example from a company that was trying to make efforts to provide better security and safety and enable rest for their employees. So the retail industry is notoriously difficult um, for workers because they often don't know their schedule in advance and they're also required to be on call. Um, and so they're forced to be available without ever knowing if they're going to have a paid shift and this can be really destabilizing. And several years ago, Gap, the global retailer, um, took the initiative to try to stabilize people's work schedules with a few simple practices like posting the schedule two weeks in advance, no more on-call shifts, having standard start and end times, allowing employees to swap to swap shifts without manager's approval. And they implemented this in over 1,500 stores at merely a cost of $31,000. Uh, $31, like had to be the least expensive shift stabilization and scheduling mechanism ever adopted. Mm. And by making their employees schedules as predictable as possible, um, what they found was during a 35 week measurement period. So two thirds of a year, they had a 5% increase in their workers' productivity, a 7% increase in sales. Um, by store, they had a 2.9 million increase in revenue due to these stable scheduling practices. Um, they also found that employees reported higher sleep quality um, throughout that 35 week period. So, there are simple things that can be done. Um, I know it can feel overwhelming to feel like everything has to be done. But again, we encourage you to think about what was the one or two things that you wrote down and start there to make a small difference that over time will become a very large one. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, before we jump to the Q&A, we just want to invite any of you that if you found benefit from today, you should surely join us for the subsequent four webinars to cover the other four topics that Emily overviewed. And they're happening each Wednesday starting next week with Connection Community with Beth Livingston and Michelle Williams, May 17th with Greg Stewart and Jennifer Nargan. On May 24th, you'll get to hear from Amy Colbert and Daniel Newton with the greatest height difference in our department. I wonder how many things are going to need a lot of boxes. And then on May 31st, Ken Brown and Steve Courtright will finish this up. Thank you again for joining. And now let's maybe have Ashley help a little bit moderating the questions uh, that we also have up on our screen. So question number one, does reading the mind with your eyes work the same in person versus virtual? Emily's going to answer all the hard questions. Oh, yeah. Um, I actually don't know the reason. I don't I, know. But I'll, here's what I'll suggest from, from the, what we know about uh, part of the reason Zoom fatigue is a thing is because we're doing it through a medium we're not used to. We're very used to this. We can do a lot more with reading body language and even the small changes in your face. And we did this on purpose. We <laughs> wanted to be in the same room, even though we could have been on different Zooms. Yeah, right. And because it helps with this and we can interrupt each other and both still be you heard right that's the thing my students tell me this they're like we don't meet on, on zoom anymore for class projects because we can't like all sort of talk and feel that energy and there is a theory and i can't remember what it's called that talks about this interpersonal warmth that occurs that allows it for us and eases communication so i would argue that um the hard part with with zoom is we may be able to if we can assume that everyone is paying attention to the meeting equally so uh, when we're in meetings, we might also be looking at email. We might be in the chat. We might be paying attention to a pet or a child or something else that's that's you know disrupting our attention to the meeting. So if everyone's paying attention, then we can assume that whatever reaction they're having is to the meeting. Otherwise, I would I would say we should be cautious because how how often are we all actually paying attention in the meeting? Yeah, and I can't point to research evidence specifically on this, so I'm mostly conjecturing. But um, I think one of the challenges with reading the mind in the eyes is that on Zoom, you're trying to read the minds of 10 to 20 people simultaneously whom you're all looking at. And then it's impossible for those who for good reason don't have their uh, video camera on. And so um, I just think it's more challenging to be able to have greater social sensitivity uh, visually during uh, virtual meetings. Mm -hmm. This also kind of connects to Betsy's question about hybrid work and how is it affecting us? Is there a need for special approaches? And I would say the research evidence crystallizing around this is that um, the work format accomplishes different things. And if people need to collaborate or discuss, mm -hmm. um, that type of group collaboration probably happens more effectively 
in person, not discounting the value of side conversations that can happen in chat because there's been a lot of that. Um, but for focus and individual autonomy, um, remote or hybrid or just being left alone mm -hmm. um, is more helpful. And so I, I've heard it, if you need focus and deep work, mm -hmm. being remote or virtual or left alone so you can individually work. And then when it's time to collaborate, communicate, yeah. that often happens better in person. I think my advice to organizational leaders would be to be very explicit about why you are asking to people to work in a specific way at a specific time so that your purposes are aligned with your methods. What would you add? Yeah, I only because I had my students listen to this podcast by Adam Grant and they yes. had Dr. Neely out of Harvard Business. Yes. I can't remember her first name. Seedle. Seedle. I may be saying it wrong. P-S-E-D-A-L. Yeah, okay. We got and if it's Seedle or Seedle. I don't, either way, Dr. Neely. A lot of times we don't actually know how to pronounce the names of colleagues because we only read them. We never hear them. That's right. So, but she was talking on the, on our, um, on the podcast with Adam Grant saying, you know, actually if it, we tend to think like very complex, this is very specific, tend to think very complex information should be communicated live. So questions can be asked and answered. Whereas she's been finding in her research that actually detailing everything, taking the extra time to write maybe a 30 minute long email so everyone can read everything and then have those meetings live for small follow-up questions is more efficient. It does require time to sit down and write a good email, um, but it can reduce the amount of time you're spending actually miscommunicating because mm -hmm. that also means the individual can go back to that information time and again. So I do think continued research is really required to think about how are we communicating? Are some of the assumptions we've historically made because we're used to me walking up, you know, a flight of stairs and coming just to your office it might be actually better that uh, to just do it as an email. Yeah, speaking of rethinking, one thing I teach my students about collaboration is that brainstorming is a terrible idea. Many people think we should get in a room and we should spit out as many ideas as possible. And the problem is, is there's a lot of production blocking happening where you're doing the incredibly complex task of trying to listen to someone else while remembering your ideas. Mm -hmm. And you just simply have to separate those two. So I often say, spend time brain writing yeah. as individuals first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then when you've got everything down, you can put them up on a screen or a board and people can stare and look at it and discuss, um, but separate the creation of ideas from their evaluation. That evaluation and discussion, that's what being in person and doing together Absolutely. is most helpful. I want to touch on, just because I've said I would, Tony's question oh, yes. on the recommendations for prior to work, because I know we've got some promotion yeah. questions yeah. too. I love this question. The research on this, if you can believe it, isn't, uh, it's pretty rare still trying to understand before work experiences. We have some research on commuting that's pretty complicated. Some research is very much for commuting. They say it gives you a chance to get ready for work and recover from work. Problem with commuting is that employees see it as part of their work day. Managers see it as part of, uh, employees see it as part of the, a part of their work and, and managers see it as part of personal time. Yeah. Almost got those mixed up. Um, and that's complicated, right? So, so that, that makes the commuting literature maybe a little less helpful. But again, uh, with any of these, Tony, I love this question. Go back to what do you do in the morning to set up your day for success? And that sounds a little kitschy. Let me try again. <laughs> what can you, what can you do at the beginning of your day to make uh, afternoon Tony happy? Like, what can you be doing in the morning? How can you be taking care of things in the morning so that by two or 3 PM, you uh, don't want to just drive home early. Um, I have spent a significant amount of time doing that for myself to set up my mornings in a way that are untouchable. Uh, I know not everyone has that option, especially if you've got people who are reliant on you, uh, especially teenagers. Are you Lots okay? Are you okay? We're okay. We're doing okay. um, uh, but I would say with any of these, do a little bit of, you know, personal research. So I backed up my mornings. I have two hours in the morning to do what I want, which is great. That also means I backed up my nights. So I go to bed pretty early now. Um, but and I, all of these decisions, that's why I teach my students. All of these decisions are around how can you make your life a little bit easier later in the day when you know you're not going to have the energy because most people's energy does start to dip just a little bit, not everyone, but uh, around 2 to 3 p.m. Um, so unfortunately, there's not a ton of research to speak from, but that doesn't mean you can't do research on yourself. There is some, and then we're talking like very recent research, some done by our colleague Daniel Newton here in the College of Business um, on uh, task transitions and how that affects your ability to engage, especially early in the workday. Um, he talked about it in a prior webinar that he and I did oh, in 2021 okay. about re-engaging at work. Um, so you can find that on our Tippy webinar series. Um, I also was a reviewer on a paper submitted to one of our academic journals 
about the speed with which people can engage at work, mm -hmm. first study of its kind. Um, and I'm not remembering the findings off the top of my head because it's been a while. But if you send me an email, I'm happy to find either the original paper or my review of it, or I'll find out if it's been published yet. Because I did know it, it ended up getting accepted at the journal. Right. That's good. Um, we have a couple other questions here. Let me. This is the, I think this is 12 weeks. Let's see. There's this one. This uh, what are suggestions for um, creating psychological safety in team meetings when what creates safety for some in attendance diminishes safety for others? This is a very insightful question because I think one perhaps erroneous implication that people might come away with is I feel free to be myself so I can be whoever I want to be and being inconsiderate of how that might affect others. And so I want to be clear that psychological safety just will not occur unless people sense that they have a sense of mutual respect and mutual purpose. Mm -hmm. It's not just enough that people respect me for who I am if I also don't have that for others. Yeah. And um, being short on time, I'll just recommend one good resource uh, to look into for, okay, there are people who are very difficult to get along with and I'm having a real struggle with them. Um, there's a book called Crucial Conversations. Uh, it's on my shelf right here. Oh, nope, I loaned it to a student. So I'm waiting for them to bring it back. Um, Crucial Conversations, it's a red cover book and there's a whole chapter about that specific topic as well. And I encourage you to pick it up. Mm -hmm. uh, I highly recommend it. And no, they are not sponsoring us. Next question. What do you think of an upper management person who is on their cell phone the entire time during a staff meeting? Maybe I shouldn't have picked this question. That's a good one. And what are your thoughts, Emily? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I think that's tough. I would think um, uh, my thought would be they have a lot going on. This is sort of that notion I have with my undergrads where I try to explain to them why their supervisors aren't maybe as understanding as they'd like them to be. There are it, pressures from the top that they don't know about. So, I mean, this is part of that psych safety. So that's an issue, right? Because what I might be hearing is that that's reducing your psychological safety, but you offering understanding to them might be increasing theirs. So the recommendation more practically would be if you feel like the power distance isn't too great to have a conversation with them. Um, but if not, this might be one of those things that you you accept, you don't like, you don't do it once you get in that position, but, but understand that maybe they have things going on we don't know. And I try to approach a lot of things that way because I find that you know, you being tenured have a lot more things on your plate than maybe I understand. And I try to be understanding of that. What do you think? Yeah. And uh, man, such a great approach. And I would also recommend this same book, Crucial Conversations. There's also an earlier webinar I did with Amy Colbert going back uh, uh, several months titled um, Managing Difficult Conversations in the Workplace. Um, and this would be one of those where there's actually more than one way to see the situation. And you might be making an assumption about the supervisor. Right. They may have a blind spot about what they're communicating when they're in a meeting and they're on their phone the whole time. And what's important is have a dialogue about, I observe this. And to me, it's communicating this, but I may not be seeing everything. Mm -hmm. And what are your thoughts about that? And um, in general, I would say probably not a great practice to be uh, basically in a different meeting with your phone when you're physically in a separate meeting, mm -hmm. but we can't always assume that we know all the details. So mm -hmm. it's, I think, a good idea to learn how to have what can potentially be a difficult conversation on that topic. We've been warned of our one minute. Ashley has communicated. Okay, one she minute. Uh, Melanie asks that research... Um, is my very own research. Yeah, I have a slide deck. I'm happy to send you a, a slide image of what the risk factors are. And yeah, things like diabetes, uh, heart disease, uh, blood pressure uh, were risk factors included. And um, yeah, so just communicate with me, email address right there. And I'm happy to show you the slide from that unpublished research. Mm -hmm. All right. Have we have we missed any questions? We have, but I don't know if we have time. Okay. If there are any that we have missed, we'll get a report afterward and we're happy to follow up Yes. Uh, for those that have asked unanswered questions. Or email directly. I'm happy to continue yes. the conversation that way. Thank you once again. It's been a pleasure having you all here. Yes, I was going to say we did not get to all the questions, but that is a common theme um, because we have so many wonderful questions coming in and you guys just provide such excellent feedback. So there are presenters, information is up on the screen. Um, like Ian said, if you have questions, you can certainly populate that 
into the uh, post event survey. There, our presenters will see that. Otherwise, please feel free to reach out to them at their emails. And I think you guys have shared some amazing information. I would also articulate that there is some uh, great information, like you said, Ian, out on the college's YouTube page where we've talked about some of the perspectives of those four agreements, you know, not taking things personally and making sure that you're thinking and being considerate of others. So great wealth of information that we've been able to build out on our YouTube channel for the Tippy webinar series. So thank you both so much for sharing your information and thank you for kicking off our wellness uh, workplace well-being webinar series. Um, when our presentation ends in just a moment, you'll see that four question survey I was talking about. We'd be so grateful if you could share your thoughts and help us make our virtual programming even better. On behalf of the Tippy College of Business, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And as always, go Hawks.